We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming to the Multibody Dynamics and Control with Python tutorial. My name is Jason Moore. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in biomechanics at Cleveland State University. I'm involved with uh, both SimPy and, and the PyDi project here, and they're tightly uh, coupled, as you guys will learn during the tutorial. My co uh, presenters are Obina Nawana, he's a PhD student at uh, Northwestern and Gilbert Getty, who is a uh, PhD candidate at UC Davis, about to finish very soon, I think, too. So, <clears throat> um, to get started, uh, everybody needs to have the software installed. So, um, this uh, Etherpad here has the links to the instructions. It'll lead you to um, the tutorial page here, where you can see the README, and it involves um, having uh, either um, we recommend Anaconda or Canopy um, uh, as the base installation for your scientific Python stack. You're going to need to install the PyDi package, which you can use pip to do that, or you can um, go to the GitHub pages and grab the latest release zip file and unzip that and use Python setup.py install. Um, the in, if the inter internet connection seems fine, but you might want to, um, actually this is this will be bad if everybody runs this because I think Mat MathJax is a big download. So hopefully the internet's fine and um, MathJax will work, but if you wanted to have it locally, that's the commands for that. And then finally, um, we're gonna be using the web browser for some WebGL 3D visualizations. Um, you wanna make sure that you have the latest, uh, the latest version of um, Firefox or Chrome, preferably. Um, we may, we probably will have some browser issues because uh, WebGL is still a precarious technology. Um, so that, that's the basics for installation. If anybody has any questions right now, does everybody have the software installed or anybody have issues? Yeah, everybody looks pretty good. If you don't, raise your hand and we have some USB sticks too with the, with the software on. Okay, so we got two, three people. You guys wanna give those guys a hand? <clears throat> so this etherpad that I have open to, feel free to, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it during the talk. Um, you guys can uh, log in, add questions. If you don't want to uh, raise your hand and ask a question, you're welcome to put it here and we can um, uh, address it once we see it. Um, or if you have any notes for other people, you're welcome to keep those notes for future, future things. So couple of uh, links, pydi.org is our, our website if you want to find out more information about uh, what we're doing. Uh, we're also tightly coupled to SimPy. So this is going to be essentially, it's partly going to be an advanced SimPy tutorial. So if you were at the SimPy tutorial yesterday with us, um, we're going to be using a lot of those techniques to solve some real problems and, and touch on some of the advanced things in SimPy. And uh, I think that that's all for introductions. How many people here have um, uh, basic uh, physics experience? Yeah. Some, okay. What about uh, dynamics and thinking about maybe robotics and things? A few, some too, okay. So we're, we're gonna um, go over, we're gonna be using uh, vector calculus today and uh, we'll give a quick refresher on that if you uh, have forgotten. And we're going to use that to solve um, and solve uh, multi-body dynamic systems, finding their equations in motion, and then simulating them. And this is useful um, to a lot of realms, and I'll go over that a little bit more. But how many people are familiar with uh, the, uh, the scientific Python stack and using IPython notebook and uh, matplotlib and sort of all the base pieces? So we have some people that it's it's new to. Okay, great. So the first notebook, the first notebook that we're going to go to, I guess uh, the. So you has everybody see this screen on their uh, on their uh, screen yet? Anybody doesn't doesn't see the notebook in the browser? Okay. So we're going to use the IPython notebook. We're going to walk through ten notebooks here, and the first one is a just a refresher on how to use the notebook and some of the bakes, basics of the scientific Python, Python stack. And uh, Obina Nawana is going to uh, lead, lead us through that. 
All right, hi everyone. This is gonna be, seem pretty basic for a lot of you, but I think we should all just get on the same page with this introduction notebook and we'll move on from there. Uh, so first off, we'll just start with a few shortcut keys to help you navigate the notebook. Uh, the IPython notebook is organized into individual cells that run the code. So to execute a, function of, a section of code, you hit control and then enter and that'll execute that uh, code cell. There's also the shortcut sh shift enter to execute that cell and then continue on to the next cell. If you press just enter, that creates a new line within the cell, allows you to keep typing code. Um, there are other commands that can control the AI Python uh, notebook environment. You can see them all by entering the command lsmagic. These are all the magic commands available to the AI Python uh, notebook. Specifically, we'll be using this command load, the uh, magic command load. So here you can load an external script into a cell within the notebook. And then you, you can then execute that cell by pressing shift enter. If you're ever lost while using the notebook, there are various ways to help you uh, f to find help. You can display the an overview of IPython's features with the question mark here. Shift enter and you'll see this window pop up, kind of an overview of IPython. Also a quick reference guide with this quick reference magic command. Also you can press just the H key on your keyboard and have all the shortcuts available in IPython notebook come up. So you won't be using all of these but as you get more familiar it'll allow you to work a lot more efficiently within the notebook. With this direct dir command, you can see a list of functions available in your workspace. So as you load in modules, you'll have more and more functions available. And maybe you need to know what you have, what you have loaded. You press this, you enter this command. Right now we just have the default uh, modules loaded. And then you can also see a list of variables within your workspace. Right now there are not any. But again, you'll see more as you work through. Uh, a basic overview of, oh, also if you want to close this window, you press this, you can click this horizontal bar to minimize it. It's a quick overview of the basic Python data types. So we have the integer, float, you can also create a float with this function. And then Python has strings. This is a three character string and a one character string. Using the type command, you can see what types of, uh, you can see the type of variable you have you can see what type of variable is. And uh, the various data structures, we'll be using primarily lists, tuples, and dictionaries. To create a list, you use the square brackets and separate each item with a comma. So here we have a, a list of strings, you can have a list of integers, you can have a list of lists and a list of variables that we created earlier above. And you can access elements within the list uh, various ways. You can have individual elements. You access the uh, each element by its, ind by its index. You can access a range of elements. You can you can uh, get each. You can get every other element. And even within a list of lists, you can access, for example, the second list, the second list of a list of lists, and then the fourth <coughs> element within that list. So here. Uh, lists are mutable, so you can change the contents within the list uh, after you've created the list. So here are various ways to do that. Next we have tuples. Tuples are like lists, but they're immutable. Once you create them, they do not change. Created the same way as, very similarly to lists, but with uh, parentheses rather than a bracket. And you'll see an error here if you try and uh, change a list because they are mutable, or immutable. You can also unpack a tuple, so each element of a tuple can be entered into an individual variable. So here we have three elements in a tuple unpacked into these three individual uh, variables. And a little quirk of uh, Python is to create a one element tuple, you need to have a, set, uh, per, uh, a comma after the first element create a one element tuple. <laughs> 
Next, uh, dictionaries. Dictionaries are uh, a set of key value pairs. So they're like, as you would have a, a word dictionary, you look up a word and get its value. Here you would have a key and then get the value stored in the dictionary. You, keys can be strings, they can be integers, and then the value can be any variable. So we have this cylinder dictionary with, a, for example, properties of the cylinder, mass, 50, or 50 base and height. And you can also create a dictionary using this zip command. You create a tuple from two lists, and then you zip those two lists together to create a dictionary. So the keys and the values match up um, in the same order that they are in the lists. Next we have functions. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward. Define a function on the, on the first line. To declare a function in the next line, uh, you indent four spaces and then have your block of code. And then lastly, a return line to return your, your values. And here's a little bit more complicated example with uh, multiple uh, multiple inputs, multiple outputs, which can be unpacked to a, which you can unpack like you would a tuple when you call the function. Uh, we'll be using several modules throughout this tutorial. To load a module, you, we, we are using the from module import command. So here, you can import a specific a function from a module, for example, the array function from the NumPy module, or here you can import multiple functions from here, the mechanics module. And if you run that, a magic who's uh, the magic, uh, the directory command, you'll see all the functions that are now available. Um, so from here, we've just imported the array command and now you can create NumPy arrays and <coughs> physics mechanics uh, reference frames. Um, okay, now here the SciPy stack. Uh, a lot of this is gonna be familiar to those of you that were at the SciPy tutorial yesterday. First is the NumPy, uh, it's a module for uh, creating n-dimensional arrays and uh, associated functions. So here we'll import from NumPy, we'll import the random li linear space zeros and A range functions. And creating an array is similar to creating a list. Uh, you would create an array with a list of, with a list, you create an array of random values using random.random. .random linear space that is uh, an array of elements from zero through one. Then there are five, five values between zero and 10. Not one. And A range is, uh, you define the step size instead of the number of elements. So here these are uh, NumPy arrays here. Accessing the elements are just like lists, so Element-wise, you get a slice of an entire column or every third element like you've seen previously. Operation, operations on arrays are element-wise by default. So here each element is multiplied, each element is squared and then added to another array. So it's not, it's not, in a, it's not a matrix multiplication or an array, it's a, like a scalar multiplication. Um, matplotlib, with the magic command inline, you can actually create your graphs within the IPython notebook, and they will show up in the cell below the code where you called it. So just run the command matplotlib with the uh, switch inline. Import, import some plotting, fun plotting functions from a matplotlib library. And here's just a simple, some simple plots. Uh, create an array of uh, x values and a function y1 and y2. We can plot these as uh, some plot commands. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We'll be using this, we'll be doing this in the future. And then also s create subplots with a subplot command. Um, so I'll just turn you loose on this little brief exercise, kind of get you warmed up. If you have any questions, feel free to ask any of us, uh, what we are doing here with this function creates three sine waves and we'll return that into these three functions. And what I want you to do is to initialize a time variable 
call the this function and plot those plot those three functions as you, in a similar fashion to here. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, so I'll give you about three to five minutes to practice with that. 
How are you guys doing? Okay, I'll slowly reveal the answers here. So, here I use the linear space command to create an array of a time, ve a time vector. And then I call the function with uh, the time vector and three values of frequency here. Oh, I didn't actually execute this cell. And I'll just load the solution in the next uh, code block for you. have something similar to this. Okay, good. See a few head shakes. Uh, so, also in this sci-fi stack we have uh, some numerical integration functions. We'll be using a different one in the uh, later notebooks, but it's nice to be familiar with uh, what comes in the SciPy package. Uh, here is the uh, ODNT. Here, what it does is uh, numerically integrates a uh, differentiable function. So here we define a function uh, dy, and it'll return the. Uh, we have a, we uh, define a function that returns the function we want to integrate. So here we have the function x. And they, we create an initial value and an array of values we want to integrate over. ODNT will uh, determine the time steps for us. So we just got to tell it the function we want, the starting point, and the value, and the, uh, a vector of values we want the uh, integration to occur over. And then we can, we, can inter we can integrate that function, store it in this y variable, and plot it. So I can imagine you know what the uh, integral for x is supposed to look like. It just x squared there. And we have a little bit of a more complicated function here. Uh, it also returns, it returns this function, but we can also pass to it a dictionary of, uh, of uh, coefficients or other values that are used within the function. So here we pass, uh, such, for example, certain parameters of the system. We pass it into ODNT with this arguments uh, command, and this is why I showed you how to create a one element tuple. Uh, that's just how this function works. You pass your dictionary of uh, whatever dictionary values that goes in your function is passed as arguments in the ODNT command. And ODNT will pass that along to the function when it calls it. And then it integrates. And lastly, uh, a review of SymPy symbolic mathematics. We'll just import everything from SymPy here, along with this interactive printing. So uh, the, the symbolic equations look, it makes for a nicer looking symbolic equations than the IPython notebook. So we can define the symbolic variables, the symbolic variables with a symbolic command. Uh, to us, it'll be known as variable A, and uh, Python will know, call it, uh, you can name the variable whatever you want and call it whatever you want within a symbol command. For example, A can equal AAA, but it's convenient to uh, keep it consistent. For example, here we have the gravity, mass, spring, constant, and time is GM, KT. And then we can manipulate uh, those variables later, or you can uh, mathematical exp algebraic expressions. And there's also the simplify command that'll simplify kind of a complicated, this is not too complicated, but you can imagine more complicated uh, symbolic equations become simplified for you. And there's also, uh, it's also possible to differentiate and integrate with the uh, symbolic package. So we're here we have uh, g times time squared over two. Integrate that, we have uh, gc, or differentiate that, we have gc. We can also take the integral of uh, just gravity, we get velocity 
can even find definite integrals. So we have the uh, equation one integrate uh, the time the time we want to integrate between and the uh, an initial value. And then finally, we can substitute uh, whatever value we want for specific variables with the subs command. So gravity here is 9.81 meters per second squared squared. And we have the final answer. All right, so that's just a quick rundown of the, uh, what the functions we're gonna be using today. Uh, we'll provide more detail as we go on with the notebook. Jason, you wanna take over the next one? Okay, so uh, that's just to get us all get us all primed. Um, remind us what kind of commands in the SciPy stack are useful. And now we're going to move into talking about dynamics. Uh, if you open up the number one uh, notebook, we're going to give a brief overview of some of the concepts that sort of lay the foundation uh, for the kinds of problems we want to solve, and also uh, the mathematical framework that that we need to be thinking about. In one, one note that I remembered about installation, if you, um, most of the tutorial will work with Python 3. Is anybody using Python 3? You, you guys are? So when we get to using the PyDi commands, it's, it's likely going to fail. It, 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 um, so you may want to switch to Python 2 if you want to make it through the, those notebooks later in the, in, the, in the thing. We haven't, uh, we're one of the laggers, I guess, and haven't, uh, the PyDi package isn't Python 3 compatible. So that, just to note that. Okay, so uh, Obina, Gilbert, and I, we all, we think a lot about uh, the motion of um, sort of macro space um, objects, uh, macro objects in space. Um, we, want to, we want to figure out how things move, what governs their motion, and some of the problems that we think about, uh, where we do biomechanics and robotics and uh, vehicle dynamics. So here's a, on, on the first image shows a few examples. Um, you can model, for example, a, a bicycle and, sort of, and predict its motion with the kind of tools we're showing. Um, quadcopters are pretty popular now. That's uh, the kind of tools we're going to talk about today. We'll also let you uh, model um, uh, vehicles like quadcopters and aero, aero, aerodynamic vehicles that, and then uh, hopefully use uh, those models to develop control algorithms for them. Uh, we also think a lot about biomechanics. The other two on the right side are model of uh, the finger and how we would press a key, press a key on a keyboard. And the one below is a, uh, a basic 2D model of a, of a human being uh, that could potentially could be simulated to make him jump. <clears throat> so all of these systems uh, are fortunately governed by a very nice rule that Isaac Newton came up for us. Uh, came up with us. He came up with three laws, but uh, the, mo the most important that we're going to talk about today is the second law of motion. And this second law of motion uh, tells us that all the forces acting on any object in, in any system um, in, is equal to its mass times its acceleration. And this key concept um, basically lets us do both forward dynamics, simulate, forward dynamics problems and inverse dynamics. The forward dynamics, pro, forward dynamics is uh, when we would know all the forces that are acting on a system and then we predict its motion. And that's what we're going we're gonna to do today. And then the opposite direction is if you know the motion, you could predict the forces, which is inverse dynamics. And this, uh, this fundamental equation um, uh, gives this relationship between acceleration and force. <clears throat> and um, and we are, but we are interested in the position ultimately. So, the um, second derivative of position is the acceleration. So, what we end up with is a an, a second order ordinary differential equation that governs the motion of an object uh, in space and time. And we're typically after what that x that x vector is, what the actual position of the, of the object in space is throughout time. And to do that, we have to integrate the equations of motion, the f equals ma, to find, uh, to find that. 
Okay. So the first thing that we have to uh, start off with, though, is, is vector calculus. So to be able to form those two vectors, the A vector and the, and the F, F vector in F equals MA, we have to use three-dimensional vector cal calculus. So the, the main thrust of uh, the software that we're going to show you today is sort of easing the bookkeeping of doing ve vector calculus. Um, typically, you might do problems like this by hand, and uh, there's a lot of algebra and trigonometry, and computer-aided algebra systems are very useful to prevent us from making sign errors and division errors and all these uh, little details that humans are really bad at. Uh, so we're going to make use of computer-aided algebra to do this vector calculus. And this is a fundamental part of the SymPy package. Um, we have a physics module, and inside there we have things like quantum physics and classical mechanics. And the classical mechanics provides us with these um, vector objects that we can start to map out these systems that we're interested in, in uh, exploring. So some basic things about vectors. <coughs> Uh, vectors have magnitude and direction, right? And they're, just, they're s typically drawn by an arrow. Um, you can also, since we're in 3D space and we always are working on these 2D screens, vectors that come out of the, out of the page may be drawn like that. And uh, vectors at the end of the page would be drawn with the, the arrow, a circular arrow in the other, other direction. So we represent vectors in general by, um, uh, with a line over top. Here, the magnitude with bars and uh, unit vectors with a hat. So we'll see those a lot in the, in the papers or in, throughout this tutorial. So the first thing that we do here is um, uh, we can initialize uh, the printing so we get nice LaTeX output on our, on our um, uh, symbolic from SymPy. And notice that I've imported from SymPyPhysics.Vector imported a reference frame. So that reference frame is going to give us unit vectors that we can build, build up chains of vectors. So here we're going to do a vector addition. The first thing that I do is create a reference frame. And then I can define vectors. And this vector here, A, is uh, a scalar C times the unit vector in the x direction of this reference frame plus a scalar D times the y unit vector plus a scalar E times the Z unit vector. If I execute that and display A, we see that we have, we have something here that is a mathematical vector. Right? We have scalars times the unit vectors. And this is the, the basic form of the, the vector that we're going to see. And I can create a second one. And then we, we get all the operations that we expect from our vector calculus class. Right? There, I just added two vectors. Um, vector addition in the same reference frame is relatively easy. You just add the components, all the scalar components for each unit vector. And uh, there are other properties of vectors too. So we can scale them, right? So I can multiply um, uh, and increase their magnitude. Uh, the, the dot product is also a useful theorem. So if I take the dot product of two vectors, uh, it can give me information uh, about the angle between the two vectors. We can use it to project, do projections. We can find the vector's magnitude by dotting it with itself. So the dot product gives us a lot of uh, power to find out things. So if I create two vectors and I import dot from SymPyPhysics.Vector, I can see that I get now a scalar CFDG plus EH here, the dot product of those two vectors. So we have dot products. We also have cross products. So um, cross products are going to help us define um, the, how uh, velocities uh, translate from linear to angular momentum, or from linear to angular, and also uh, help us define torques and, and, uh, and how they act. So we can also do cross products. So if I cross uh, vector A with a vector B, I'm going to get a different vector. And so um, the, the vector that uh, is produced by a cross product is all, always orthogonal or perpendicular to the, both of the other vectors, if you guys remember from calculus. Is this, uh, 
uh, thumbs up middle or down if this is like um, too fast in calculus or is, do people want more explanation of these or these things you remember from class good good slowly just move up move move faster okay so um, we got vectors we can do all these operations symbolically uh, one of the key th key things that we're going to try to do I'm going to just draw on the board uh, briefly is um, we want to map out points in space on, on rigid bodies we're going to work with a uh, human-like like body today and try to map out the more significant points. What do you think are the most important points that we want to know in terms of F equals MA? Any idea? Center of mass. So it turns out that um, we don't have to know the motion of every point in a, in a rigid body. We only have to know uh, the acceleration of the center of mass. So typically, we're trying to map those out with vectors. Um, one of the key concepts is uh, we're going to use reference frames that are attached to each rigid body. And uh, if I have a reference frame here in a 2D plane, <coughs> I have an X unit vector and a Y unit vector. And um, I have points here, O. And then if I have another reference frame that's rotated relative to the first reference frame, we'll call that we're going to try to we're going to make use of multiple reference frames to map vectors of points. So if I have a point that I know is defined in this reference frame, say this reference frame is attached to my arm, and I want to know the point of my uh, uh, wrist bone here, then a vector from my elbow to my wrist bone might be here. This um, <clears throat> this could be my this could define my uh, upper arm and my lower arm, and we can use these reference frames that I know that my elbow has an angle that it rotates relative to the to the other frame, theta, for example. And we're going to use this kind of concept to walk and get to the points. And this may actually a, be a better description would be this would be the center of mass. Of my get there, um, we might, we're going to be ultimately interested in this vector, call that x. So x, right, just the addition of uh, w plus v. But we may def we're typically going to define w in terms of the reference frame that's attached to the Scalars A W times N X plus B W times N Y. Right? And then V we define um, in the lower arm, and that would be the A V times A X. Anybody know how, how those can be added if there are two different reference frames? Any idea what the relationships are? So ultimately we need to know how a how these unit vectors in the A frame relate to unit vectors in the N frame and what 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 relates to those. Any idea? What's the difference? A rotation matrix. some information about how the, this frame is relative to the, to the, the end frame, the A frame is relative to the end frame. So, for example, uh, this vector, if I project it into, if I project the AX into the NY, 
write out relationships like Ennis, Cosine of AX cosine of theta equals NY. Right? So these relationships exist, and I can plug them in. And once I write all the, uh, if I can write the vector V in terms of N, I get um, A. same reference frame, A, and all I have to do is to add them to, do the, to come up with X, and I get um, AW sine theta plus EV. Right, and that's all in the, in the Y direction. And then plus VW cosine theta This, this gets really nasty, like just doing that simple one gets my brain a headache. Um, but this is going to help us map out points. If we can define vectors and points using um, uh, these vector definitions, we'll ultimately be able to let, <laughs> let uh, SymPy and symbolic algebra take care of this operation. So we don't have to think very much at all about all these cosines and sines and the rotation matrices. So if we go down, check out the notebook a little more. We can see that um, here I create a reference frame A, right? This is, um, in this case, I should have used the same variable names, but this would be reference frame A. And then I create a reference frame B using A to orient it. I orient A, um, I mean, I orient B relative to A about its axis theta about the AZ unit vector. So the Z unit vector is pointing out forward, the theta wraps around that, that unit vector, right? So then I can define those two vectors, A and B, in two different reference frames. And then I can add them, right? And we can see that it, it, it adds the vectors, and I have uh, unit vectors in, in two different reference frames. I can dot them. We notice that there's some sines and cosines in there, which are the same ones that I figured out there on the board. We can cross them, right? Also, if I want to explicitly express that new vector AB in one reference frame, um, I get the, uh, should get the result that I have on the board. But maybe I'm wrong. Oh, the, the bo this one's a little, this one's in 3D, so we have one extra term. But fundamentally, it takes care of all those sines and cosines for us. Um, and if you want to see the rotation matrix uh, that's involved, uh, you can pull that off of the reference frames that you've created. So in this case, B is a reference frame. DCM stands for direction cosine matrix. And I get the rotation matrix that was involved in, in the relationship of two, of two, uh, two frames. So 
So, oh, for the video, um, Gilbert was just expressing that um, the hopefully the example that we're going to get to in the next in the next notebook is going to clear up why why this is important. If I'm boring everybody to death, which I'm assuming that's what what the comments about. So how, does this uh, make sense to everybody or, right, we're good, we're all good? To speed up, slow down? Same up here, um, the distance I used uh, AB uh, is the x direction, which is this distance, AB, right? And then this distance is uh, <coughs> so I define. Those are where the scalars come from. Yes. One's a scalar and one's a vector, a unit vector. Who asked that? Unit length like one. one. And it represents one of these three base directions before that associated in parentheses frame. Four four two. Which which one did I screw up? A and B. All right, so I may have had that. There's some better diagrams in the notebook. Uh, oh, yes. Is it normal to see a four-letter warning on the direction matrix? We are getting, that's a SymPy known bug, and he'll give you the quick fix for that. If anybody else gets that pink format warning, um, that isn't, yeah, you can ignore it. It's not that big of a deal. Does there, would anybody like to see another example? of this, or do you want me to move on? Sure. Yes. How would you multiply that matrix of vector? Yeah, we, we'll come to that later, but um, so that produces a, uh, a matrix form of that, of that uh, rotation matrix. And if you had a SymPy column matrix, a, co a column vector, you can you can just do multiply just uh, with the, the Python star symbol. So if you created, for example, I can do that real quick. Let me get back up here. So we had a rotation matrix. If, uh, for example, I do um, from from SymPy import uh, matrix, right, and then I do a, a column vector here of uh, one, two, three, and then I multiply that. There you go. So you can you can do all matrix operations with these these things, but uh, you'll f we'll find that that's not that necessary. We usually don't. We're not going to have to pull out that matrix a lot. 
Yeah, so it's, <clears throat> so yeah, you may think uh, about, uh, a lot of times we can just write a vector, right, as a column, column matrix. Sure. So, isn't one of the things that helped me uh, when I was originally learning dynamics understand why you want to use Basis vectors given. You, know, you all remember the right hand rule. <coughs> X and Y cross and you get Z. So then take this and have another. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. Uh, then have these rows. So it's another color. Let's say we have another little. little box has a little top on it. Make sense? And someone asks you to find the distance from point down here and point over here. Right? So if you're just thinking in one reference frame, the way you're going to do this is probably try and calculate the distance to here and here, here and here and so forth, and multiply them by the rotation matrices and all that. Probably how you do that, right? No, maybe. You guys probably haven't had to do that ever. Uh, so a, a different way to do it is you give your little flap up here its own coordinates. Call that dx. So when you're coming up with your position vector between the two of these. Express them in basically whatever the natural basis vectors are for the object they're on. So rather than having to go through the cosines and everything like that, you would have the O to T being minus AX plus AY plus DX. Does that make sense how using only four symbols and no sines, no cosines, nothing confusing, you can express you know, that, that distance or position vector. Does that make sense to everyone? So that, that's a lot of what PyDi does is <coughs> keeps you from having to do this or compute GCMs and multiply vectors by them. You know, it doesn't force you to go through one reference frame we're only working with one rotation matrix. It just keeps it all symbolic like this. Uh, maybe maybe one, one more comment to maybe address what you asked too. If we, if we only work with these column vectors, we would we'd be forced to do all these cosines and sines. We're working in one reference frame. So uh, a, column, a column vector in matrix form doesn't tell you what reference frame it's defined in. It's always defined in the, in, the, in the one reference frame that you're talking, talking about. So well, we, we add this extra information that says we have a column vector, but it's defined in a certain reference frame. And then that allows us to let the computer do all the nasty sines and cosines and take care of that. And we can rotate 1,000 frames in all different 3D coordinates and, uh, and think about it in a much simpler manner. Yes. Yes. The red one. So, so the, the command for that, this would be beta, which is a which is about the
orient new command. simple axis rotation, which is just about one, one vector. That one vector is, um, let me get the order wrong, theta, theta, it's theta. So the first thing we do is we tell it in the tuple or a list, theta is the angle that we're going about the axis. And then the axis that we want to rotate around is a dot t. So that, that's what that does. And that gives us two, two reference frames that are now rotated. They know all, how all the sines and cosines and the direction cosine matrix, the rotation matrix between them. And when we create vectors in them, um, every, it's, it's, it's aware. Good question. And I need to remember to repeat the questions. So we've talked about rotation mat matrices. That was the, this next bit in the reference frames. I think we've, we've sort of explained that. The next thing is um, all of these... Uh, Scalars that we have, uh, I'm sorry, these scalars like A, B, and B, W, they may change with time, right? So if P is the point of the box, and I'm standing here and I'm wiggling the top back and forth, right, the, uh, so we have the theta is changing. So the, the, this, uh, the vector that goes from O to P, right, it changes as we all of the, uh, the this vector is, is, a, has a, is a function of time, right? So the other thing that we keep track of with these vectors is uh, the time dependence of them. And uh, we specify positions. And then Newton's law requires for accelerations. So we have to differentiate twice to get the accelerations to form Newton's second law. So we're able to do, if we have a general vector, we can take um, the derivative of those vectors. So when it, when it rotates, we, yeah, the, uh, so Gilbert's saying that I should, ex I should explain that um, the A-frame is sort of static, and when the, the box lid goes up and down, the B-frame is, is just rotating relative to the A-frame. So, so you guys understand if you take the, the vector In uh, managing derivatives of vectors that are defined in different frames is tricky, and uh, uh, there's a lot of bookkeeping involved. And so that in the background, we're able to do that. So here I just had a vector A. I took the um, derivative of A with respect to C, one of the scalars here, and, uh, and I get the result. And we'll, you'll, we'll see more of that in the kinematics dis discussion. Um, the next bit here is uh, talking about angular velocities and angular accelerations. And um, we've got um, some theorems that define how, if I want to take the uh, derivative of vector p in this case um, in the A frame, in one frame, and I know it in the, uh, how it changes in the B frame and how the B frame is changing with respect to the A frame rotating. Same example, um, P would be this vector. And we're interested in um, uh, how it changes. And Gilbert's comment about that uh, the derivative of P, I'm going to get lost in this. Um, 
So this, this theorem basically says that um, <clears throat> if we uh, want the derivative of, one, of a vector in one frame, and we know some information about how that frame is, rotate, is uh, rotating with respect to the frame we're interested in, we, we get a sort of a, a simpler theorem here, here to deal with than trying to explicitly take out take the derivatives. And the, the code is going to take care of these um, inherently for us. Do you want to comment? Yes, it's uh, where were we at? So if we have two little reference frames again, and this one here is moving, it's rotating. You might have basis vector Vx, right? But you're interested in how Vx is changing with respect to time. And that's not just as simple as saying the time derivative of Vx, which would be 1, because it's less than 1. What you need to do is look at, you need to specify where you care about the time derivative. The time derivative of a vector right here in this frame is in the A-frame, it does change. So that's what, what uh, the theorem Jason has there explains, that you have to look at basically the rotational velocity of this reference frame to determine how the basis vector, or any vector is defined, which components in that, ch in that frame change with respect to time. Yeah. Does that clarify it a little? So, um, I think the I think if we get into the actual problem, this stuff will uh, be better. So, position, velocity, acceleration. Um, there's also the same things for linear and angular acceleration. Um, and we'll get into that as we as we do the problem, instead of talking about it in a very general way. We're also going to have to deal with inertia tensors. Right, so in general, uh, the inertia of a, of a rigid body is described by a, um, a, a symmetric matrix that has the moments of inertia along the, the diagonal and the products of inertia along um, on the off-diagonal terms. And it's nine, uh, nine terms total that, that describe the inertia of a rigid body, um, but only uh, six essential ones because it's a symmetric matrix. We're going to talk about um, a thing called an inertia dyadic also, and Gilbert will explain that when we get to it more. Um, but it fundamentally, the same way that we use this notation to handle vectors in different frames, we can uh, express inertia, ten we can express tensors in different frames uh, with a similar notation. And it's sort of gonna, that's going to be a lot behind the scenes. Uh, but this is this is what a dyadic looks like. It involves the outer product between um, the unit vectors, and uh, and it has all the scalars that are associated with the inertia tensor we see. And this is just a quick demo of how you would create those. So if I have uh, the different uh, inertia values, I can create inertia inert, inertia tens, uh, inertia dyadic in line 33 and in line 44. I can also show its its matrix form to show that that they're equivalent. Right. Uh, we're going to be creating forces and uh, moments and torques that act on the system. And um, in general, for a force, it's simply a vector, but it acts on a point. And we're going to use a tuple of a, of the force vector, and the um, and the and a point P in this case to define the bound vector. So Forces are going to always act on a specific point in the system, and there's a, and a corollary to that is all all the torques that we define too are going to act between reference frames. So with all those pieces of the puzzle, we get the forces and the torques, the accelerations, uh, the linear accelerations a and the angular accelerations alpha, uh, 
we can form uh, not only Newton's second law, but um, in addition, Euler's uh, torque equation. So we get the full equations of motion of the system by specifying the uh, accelerations and angular accelerations and all the forces and torques acting on the body. And we can rearrange those into a, a first order form of the differential equation where X are all the time varying parts of the system. And so the derivative of those time varying parts are going to be some um, rearrangement of this F, F equals MA and T equals I alpha. I alpha. So that gives a little bit of that. And then finally, to get the position of the motion, we need to integrate that x dot equation. And that's going to give us the trajectory of all the, all the uh, points and things that we're interested in through space. So that's a rapid um, sort of intro to rigid body dynamics and, some, and the vector calculus that you need. Um, it's, it's definitely too rapid. Uh, but I think what you'll find in the next, next few notebooks that we'll be able to assemble and piece together and, and make, make an object move without having to have too much of the theory um, under our belt. And you'll, you'll have to go back and read those, of course, and, and, um, and there's, there's plenty of books on the, on the topic, too. So the next notebook, notebook number two, gives a little introduction to the problem that we're going to try to solve right now. So we're going to try to model a human being. Um, in this, and in this case, we want to try to think about how a human being sort of um, balances and stands up in just a, in a 2D plane. We're going to have three degrees of freedom, rotation at the ankle, the knee, and the hip. And, uh, and this diagram gives, gives an idea of how we're going to model the person, right? We have a foot, an ankle joint, a knee joint, and a hip joint. And each of the colored pieces are going to be defined as rigid bodies. Right, so they have a mass center, which is the location of the um, uh, little mass center point here that are defined by these variables, these distances. And they also have inertia associated with them, a mass and inertia for each, each object. Right, so it, it, it's going to take torque to be able to rotate these, these objects in space. And, um, and there's also going to be torques that sort of simulate our, our muscles. So we're, we activate the muscles that can make our legs um, extend and flex. Uh, so we're going to model those with simple torques. And if we can get the right torques, we can probably make this person stand up after we get the model working and derive. So uh, a few other things. There's um, going to be three reference, fr uh, four reference frames. The inertial reference frame, I, the lower leg, L, the upper leg, U, and the um, uh, torso T. We're going to use three angles to de define those rotations. So we see the rotation between L and U, those two reference frames, is theta 1. The rotation between U and T is, uh, I, I skipped one, sorry. The rotation between I and L is theta 1. Between L and U is theta 2. And between U and T is theta 3. So three, these uh, four bodies, three pin, pin joints, and uh, three angles that define their relationship. And those angles change with time, right? We, um, we are always moving and balancing. And uh, the, four, the three rigid bodies that we'll, we'll have here, just the torso, upper leg, and lower leg. And I think that's fundamentally all. So we're going to see these. Uh, we'll bring this picture back up while we're deriving the problem, and we'll see uh, the various uh, point names and the um, uh, dimensions and things, too, that will help us sort of form these vectors. So if you can imagine, what we're going to try to do is write some vectors that go from each pin joint uh, using these, three, these different reference frames and also map out a point to each of those uh, mass center locations. If we get those pieces, then we can, we'll get the accelerations, uh, and we can form, and then we add in the torques and, uh, and also the, the uh, force due to gravity, and piece all that together, and we're going to end up with the equations of motion of the system. Any questions so far? Is that clear on the kind of what we're going to try to build? Okay. All right, Obina. <laughs> 
So Mina is going to lead us through the um, doing, setting up these vectors and the kinematics of the problem. All right, so to create our model here, first step is to define the kinematic relationships between the rigid body segments. So that is uh, defining the position of each segment and various points of interest uh, within each segment and also their relationships to each other, uh, their linear and angular velocities. Uh, so we'll set up our notebook here, import these modules of Senpai and the mechanics module and then also initialize printing, uh, this pretty printing. And here we'll, uh, it says to allow the display of images in our notebook. Okay, so first we have the inertial reference frame, that is uh, the world frame, it's not gonna be uh, moving. And then we have the lower leg reference frame, where we c we'll call it a lower leg reference frame and uh, it'll be known as the uh, letter L. So uh, as an exercise, I want you to create a reference frame for the upper leg and for the torso, similar to using these commands. Are you guys good? So you should uh, have this. So upper leg reference frame equals reference frame U, call it U here, and source of frame, call T. So right now these frames are initialized where they're just kind of freely floating in space. We need to uh, define their orientations relative to each other and we'll do that with the variables data one, data two, data three, like we saw in the diagram. So we'll create those data variables with this uh, dynamic symbols uh, function. So theta one, theta two, three. Yes, so dynamic symbols are symbols that are time varying, so they change with time, yes. Okay, so we have our theta defined. And now to orient each uh, reference frame. So starting with the uh, lower leg reference frame, we define it as an angle theta from the inertial reference, reference frame. So using the uh, method orient, we'll orient it to the inertial reference frame about, axis, about an axis, and that axis is uh, the inertial frame Z about, uh, by the angle theta one. So yeah, it's like the uh, orient command, uh, orient new, it's similar to the orient new command. Oh, need to actually run these cells. Okay, so now that we have defined the position, the orientation of these reference frames to each other, we can display the direction cosine matrix of the lower leg relative to the inertial reference frame. And we can also do the reverse to display the uh, reference frame, the inertial reference frame relative to the lower leg frame. You can see the cosines are pretty much uh, 
the sines and the cosines are just the opposite uh, values. Next, we do the same for the uh, other, for the uh, upper leg relative to the lower leg. Similar command again, upper leg frame dot orient to the lower leg frame uh, about the z axis by theta 2. And here we can start to see how we can see the upper leg frame relative to the inertial reference frame, how that oriented. You can see how complicated it's getting with only two reference frames. And as we add on a whole chain of additional reference frames, you can see the advantages of using a computer algebra system to keep track of all this. You can simplify this, and uh, Senpai will just add the, uh, the uh, trig and trig uh, functions together, simplify that for you. So as an exercise, try and orient the torso reference frame to, torso frame to the uh, upper leg frame. So he asked if I, if you try to orient a reference frame to an, to an, in a way that's circular to another reference frame that doesn't make sense or something, it would detect that. Um, it, yeah. So if you, for example, try to orient a reference frame to itself, or something like that. User beware. That that is the the answer. Uh, we trust that if you are using this, you know not to do that. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it's very complicated to have something to manage how all the frames are defined versus just the implicit un understanding that you won't continually redefine reference frames relative to each other, breaking loops and stuff, how they're defined. So to sum that up, make sure you keep track of the reference frame and the orientations to each other. Don't uh, define a reference frame in a circular fashion. So um, I see all of you should probably have this done. You should have something like this. Okay, and then we have the uh, directional cosine matrix of the torso to the inertial frame. Okay, the frames are defined not to define uh, points of interest, so joint centers and uh, center of mass locations. First, we'll define the joint centers. Pretty simple here. We'll define the ankle joint as point A. And then we'll define the lower leg length. And then also a knee joint. Okay, the points are defined not to uh, set the positions of the points relative to each other. Similar to the uh, orient frames command, we have the set position command. So the knee, we set the position relative to the ankle. It's a distance of the, it's a distance away by the lower leg length along the uh, Y frame. So to look back at the figure real quick, uh, the vertical up and down is the uh, Y axis. So the knee is, uh, we have this uh, 
kind of a vector here. The magnitude is lower leg length and the, along the y-axis. And then we can view that position from the knee, the knee position from the ankle with this vector. And then we can express that in the inertial frame or perhaps any other frame we have already defined. And then similarly, we can define the hip point relative to the knee and view that position in the, uh, in the, in the uh, I believe that's the upper leg frame. And then also view it in the, in the inertial frame. So see if you can do that for the center of mass locations. So define, a center, define points for the center of mass and set the locations of the center of mass relative to a previously defined point. We'll use the distances DL, DU, and DT to locate the center of masses relative to the uh, most distal joints. So starting with the ankle, we'll define the center of mass of the lower leg, and from the knee, define the center of mass of the uh, upper leg and the torso too, okay? Hidden cell, because there's a hidden cell right there. 
you guys doing? Let's continue on. You should have something very similar to this. So define each uh, the length of the, each. Uh, let's find the distance of the define the center of mass length from the previous joint at this uh, command here. Then define each each mass center with a point command. Set the position, and then you can view the position. So it's pretty systematic. You can define a reference frame, define the orientation, define a point, define the uh, position relative to another point, and it'll be pretty similar with velocities later on too. Okay, uh, at this point we're gonna define the differential equations, kinematic differential equations. So. Here we have omega one, two, three. These are the time derivatives of uh, the thetas. We'll define them as the dynamic symbols also. And we're gonna enforce the relationship. So omega is a time derivative of theta, and we'll rewrite that as omega minus uh, theta dot equal to zero. And we're gonna store those differential equations in this uh, list here. going to use these in the uh, time to uh, in the angular velocities of uh, each uh, Richard's body segment. So uh, similar to setting the uh, position, the uh, positions of each point will set the angular velocity of each frame. So I'll have the lower leg frame set the angular velocity relative to the inertial frame uh, by omega theta omega one over along the z axis coming out of the page. and then we can view what that angular velocity is, theta well, in the uh, z-axis. I'll uh, do the same for the angular velocity of the upper leg frame and the torso. It gets repetitive, but it's a very systematic process. Okay, so you should have something similar to this. Set the angular velocity, and then you can use the angular velocity in 
method to view what that is. Next is to define the linear velocities of the center of masses. Uh, first, we'll define a linear velocity of the inertial reference frame. So we don't actually define a world frame or anything. We just set the inertial reference frame to have a, a velocity of zero, and that becomes effectively our world frame that's stationary and doesn't move, and everything is defined relative to that. So here, angle is uh, in the inertial reference frame, and we set that velocity to zero. Now, using this uh, little formula here, we can define the uh, velocities of the center of masses if we know the velocity of another point and the, velo and the angular velocity of the rigid body that point is on. So I think it'll help if I draw this on the board to illustrate. That's just what this formula is saying here. So using the V2P theory method, we know the velocity of the ankle in the inertial frame. Um, and we want to know the velocity of the lower leg in the uh, lower leg mass center in the lower leg frame. So we see here we have this, uh, basically that distance from the angle to the, to the center of mass times the angular velocity in the uh, x direction, which is in the image uh, backwards here. Similarly, we do the same for the uh, upper leg mass center. At this time, at this point, we know the, we know the velocity of the knee so we do the same to find the velocity of the upper leg mass center and then also the torso, the hip and the torso. Okay, so in this notebook, we define the kinematic relationships between the rigid bodies. So we know the orientations of each reference frame, the positions of uh, the joints, center of masses, and their velocities. Uh, in the next notebook, we will define the inertial properties and I believe that's what's next. Yes, the inertial properties, and Gilbert will take you on with that. Okay. So uh, the first thing, as you can see right here, whether you got everything right or not doesn't really matter because throughout the, as we go through this process, we have solutions for each step. So don't worry if you got things wrong before or you didn't complete them. But what we're going to go over now is the inertias of uh, the rigid bodies. So first, import those things. And next, we're going to import two more, uh, one function, one object from mechanics, inertia and rigid body. So these are basically, one, a helper function to help you define the inertia for a rigid body, and two, a container class called rigid body. Uh, we also need to do some basic imports again, symbols, and printing, so things look nice. So a rigid body has a few different things associated with it. Uh, it has a center of mass, it has an inertia, it has a reference frame, and uh, I think a name is the fourth thing we make it have. But it's basically just a way to store a bunch of information that 
describes a body in one place. It, it's, it's a container class. So the first thing we need to do before we make these classes is, uh, or these objects, is to define you know, their, their attributes. So first we're gonna define a bunch of masses. Lower leg mass, upper leg mass, torso mass. They all have symbols associated with them, ML, MU, MT. Makes sense to everyone, right? So just go through and define those. It's a pretty you know, trivial step, I imagine, by now for you guys. Uh, the next part's a little more complicated. So, yeah, this is only a 2D problem. So we're only gonna look at basically one uh, moment of inertia for these bodies. The whole software is written around the idea of working in uh, 3D space. That's why it's a lot more complicated than is necessary for this simple problem. So uh, hopefully that, that'll help you guys understand why there's so much focus on vector calculus and things like that and being explicit about things. But anyways, for this problem, we only need three moments of inertia. We title them I LZ, I UZ, and I TZ. So the Z moment of inertia for the lower, upper, and torso. And they're just symbols. But next we're gonna use this function called inertia to generate what's called a dyadic. Uh, so you guys, who here is familiar with like a inertia tensor or matrix? Okay, so those aren't always good in these problems. In fact, sometimes they're awful because they have no information. When you have that matrix with you know six numbers in it, it has no information at all about what it's related to, what it's defined relative to, if it's about the if it's a central moment of inertia or about another point, what frame it's associated with. None of that exists when you just have six numbers in a matrix. So dyadic's an alternative way to represent this tensor, and it basically uses uh, similar vector notation to associate each entry in the inertia tensor with coordinates. So what this first uh, function of inertia does is it basically does this for you. Rather than having to make you type in all the commands to generate an adiatic, you give it either the three principal moments of inertia or the three principal moments of inertia and the three products of inertia. And then you also have to tell what reference frame this is defined in. That's what makes it adiatic. So we execute these two commands and you'll see we have ILZ, the rotational moment of inertia of the lower leg and it's defined uh, or it's multiplied by the dyadic IZ, outer product IZ. So that's how dyadic is defined as the outer product of vectors. Is that familiar to you guys? Maybe, no? I, I'm guessing no. <laughs> that's okay. It, it, it's uh, most of the time it's actually not really too important from the user perspective because you are probably originally getting your numbers from the inertia matrix. We just force you to put it into a basis frame explicit form, which is the dyadic. That's, that's probably a key theme here is we force the user to be explicit in order to get consistent results because we're working with analytical symbolic solutions rather than numeric results. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing for, uh, or I'm sorry, Here's, here is the inertia matrix for that example, right? All zeros and then the Z component is I, L, Z. So then we're gonna do the ex exact same thing for the central, I'm sorry, for the, uh, no, I'm sorry about that. Uh, the inertia, dyadic has been defined in a frame, as we saw here, but as far as the rigid body is concerned, you also need to tell it what this inertia dyadic is defined relative to. Uh, most of the time, you will define this relative to the moment of inertia, I'm sorry, the center of mass, right? The central inertia dyadic is what you'll use. Uh, For this example, you would define the moment of inertia of this body 
one. Sometimes it makes sense. Usually not. Have you guys ever done that before? Using non-central inertia matrices? It's okay. It's not really important. Just it's a uh, in the software, it automatically transforms that inertia matrix for you to a central one. So if someone else gave you the moment of inertia as measured from other some complicated arrangement, you don't have to do that manually. It happens automatically. Okay. Now we do the same thing for the upper leg and the torso. Okay, so the last few parts are basically just putting the container class together. And we, for each rigid body, we tell it a name, so that way uh, it prints out correctly. A mass center, a reference frame associated with it, a mass, and an inertia. So just execute these commands, and then you've made them. It's pretty simple. Do you guys have any questions about inertias and forming rigid bodies? Okay. All right, so next topic is kinetics. And just like before, we're gonna import the solutions. Uh, gets into kind of a dynamics point. The way it was taught to me was when you have Newton's equation, you have F equals MA. So this A part is kinematics, what do we know went over, right? The M part is inertia of masses, which I just went over. F is what's sometimes called kinetics. It's basically just the forces and torques acting on a body. And then the equal sign in the middle is dynamics. So yeah, like I said, the first thing we do is import the uh, correct progress from the previous step. Turn on printing and turn on images. Does this one have an image in it, Jason? Or is that the end? Okay. Well, the first thing we're gonna do is create the gravity force vectors. So, uh, just like before, like I said, it's a common theme, we force you to be explicit about basically defining forces and torques as vectors rather than just, you know, F equals MA writing as a scalar equation. So we define our G symbol for gravity. And then the first thing we're going, going to do after that is define the lower leg gravity force vector. So we have the mass of the lower leg times G, and we're pointing downwards, that's the, the negative sign, in the inertial frame Y direction. Does that make sense to everyone? So if you remember the leg, right? No matter what angle the legs are at, you want it to be actually pointing down, so use the inertial frame. So minus GML IY. And then the next step what we're going to do is basically tell, we have to, for every time you have a force, you have to specify where that force is applied. If a force is not applied at a mass center, it will cause rotation, right? Torque is uh, R cross F, yeah. So when you supply these uh, forces, you have to tell it explicitly where. And that's what we do here is we make another tuple and lower leg mass center, where we're flying it, and then the gravitational force vector. All gravitational force forces are applied at mass centers. So it's fairly trivial, but again, common theme of explicitness. And you can see that, you know, point vector, the two components to it. And we do the exact same thing for the upper leg and torso. Same process of point, mg times inertial y, 
negative. Does that part make sense to everyone? Okay. This next part is torques. And you guys have probably solved you know, simple problems. Uh, M equals I alpha, right? Euler's basic rotation thing. It, it's pretty much the same thing, except you know we use uh, torque vectors and have more complicated inertia as possible, as you saw previously. So we're going to define our symbols for torques: T A, T K, T H, ankle, knee, and hip. And yeah, now we have our image. So for the lower leg, we have two torques acting on it. One about the ankle and one about the knee. That should make sense to everyone, I, I hope, yeah. Uh, basically, we just have to add uh, the product of the torque and the, the vector it's pointing in from the ankle and from the knee. So our torque vector here is ankle torque times the inertial frame, Z basically you know, the vector coming out of the projector. And we subtract the knee torque times the inertial frame Z again because as you can see, they are going in opposite directions. Plus, minus, fine, yeah. And there's our, our nice uh, torque vector there. TA minus TK, I dot Z. Uh, and just like with the points and forces where we force you to define where the force is applied, a torque has to be applied to a reference frame. So you have to be explicit and say, the lower leg torque is the lower leg torque vector applied to the lower leg frame. And so we do the same thing for the upper uh, leg where we have the hip torque which is gonna be negative in sign, and the knee torque, which is positive. And if you guys remember, that knee torque is opposite in sign of the previous one. So you had minus TK here, positive TK on the next one. That's because of Newton's, uh, which, which one Newton's law is it? Third law, third law. Uh, equal and opposite forces. And finally we have the torso, and that just has the hip force acting on it. And, yeah. So any questions about defining these uh, force and torque vectors and how they are related to the rigid bodies? Hopefully it's fairly clear. Basically just, you need to use vectors and you need to tell the program where things are happening. So, yeah. So, uh, so you can, it, it gets into some sort of a little abstract thing, but you can apply torques to, uh, basically in the same way that a, a, a force acts on a point, and that point is somehow connected to a body which has mass, which leads to translational motion. You can apply torque to a reference frame which is somehow linked to a rigid body, which allows for a rotational motion. Sometimes it's more convenient to have an intermediary reference frame, which is fixed to that rigid body, but it's not its natural frame. Uh, there's also other situations that are fairly rare where you would have, uh, say, a massless reference frame, or uh, if you have a rigid body that has no inertia associated with it, but still has a torque applied to it. 
also gets a bit into the, the next part, which is the equations of motion and how they're actually formed and a mathematical definition for that. So. But, but basically, the most common time when you use it, not just for a rigid bodies frame, would be if you just had an intermediary helper frame to make the math a little easier. Any other questions? Okay. So the next part is forming the equations of the motion. Uh, did, did you already ask about if anyone here has heard of Keynes method? Has anyone here heard, heard of Keynes method? One of you. Okay. Kane. His name is uh, Thomas Kane, right? It's like 90 something now. Uh, anyways. Kane's method, uh, who, who here has heard of Lagrange's method for finding equations of motion? All right, most of you. So you've heard that referred to as a virtual energy approach, right? We form the kinetic and potential energies. Kane's method is sometimes referred to as a virtual work approach where you, you don't need to form energies, but you, stu you uh, still manage to simplify the problem by automatically removing non-contributing elements. So. Uh, this, it, it's, you know, a few weeks of a graduate class, so we're not going to go into that much detail on it, other than there's some pecu peculiarities to how you format the problem, and then it's automatically computed for you. So we're going to import our solution from before, and this time we're going to import TrigSimp to simplify some of our results, make them easier to read, and the Keynes method object, and then we're going to turn on printing, and we've got the little help here for Keynes method. And if we can bring this up. All right. So this object's used to do bookkeeping as you go through the equation of motion. Here's a nice reference. This reference is available through the Cornell eCommons digital library for free. You guys could all go download this right now uh, if you wanted. Maybe, maybe don't do it all together. That'll be bad for the internet. Here, but uh, yeah, it, it's free to download. It's a really good reference. I'd recommend you know, going and downloading it at no cost. Yes, yes, we also have code for Lagrange's method to do automatically. And uh, we, we haven't actually done Newton Euler code because it's, it's fairly trivial to do relative to these. So we, we kind of left that for end users to do. One of the other authors, actually, Luke, uh, pretty much always does Keynes method manually without the helper class, so. But uh, yeah, help file here, lots of stuff. We won't really look at it right now. Okay, equations of motion. So, as a minimum for a unconstrained system, uh, the Keynes method class needs to know generalized coordinates, generalized speeds, kinematic differential equations, forces, rigid bodies, and the inertial frame. Uh, stepping back for a second, who here knows what the difference between a holonomic and non-holonomic system is? No one? Who here has heard those terms? Okay. Uh, it's not terribly important what the difference is right now. One's basically has motion constraints, the other does not. Uh, where, why it's relative here is Keynes method is one of the few approaches that lets you handle non-holonomic systems without any extra work, basically. So you don't have to introduce Lagrange multipliers to solve your problem. The other thing that's uh, different about Keynes method is if, if you guys have used Lagrange's method, you remember you have the generalized coordinates, you have their derivatives, you have Qs, Q dots, and Q double dots, right? Keynes method is also unique in that you can you have generalized coordinates and generalized speeds, and these terms don't have to be just the straight derivatives of the uh, coordinates. <coughs> so that allows you to do some pretty significant simplification of your system, how it's defined, and the resulting equations of motion. But for this example, it's a pretty trivial definition. So our coordinates are theta one, theta two, theta three, three rotation angles. And we're gonna put them in a nice list. Speeds are omega one, omega two, omega three. Again, put them in a list. 
and the kinematic differential equations as Obina showed, omega one minus theta one dot, so forth. Those are all in the list again. Uh, so the first thing we do is initialize the Keynes method object. We tell it the inertial frame we're using, the coordinates, speeds, kinematic differential equations, all the things we just introduced. If you did have a constraint system, you'd introduce stuff here, but you know, we don't have that for this example. <coughs> okay, so the next thing we have to do is put all our forces and torques, those two poles we defined, into a list. And it's gonna go through that list and apply all of those to the system. <coughs> so you guys can see it prints out the names for each of the points and reference frames and the associated uh, force and torque vectors for them. And then we need to make a list of all the rigid bodies and if there were any particles, basically, you know, bodies without inertia, they would also go in that list. Lower leg, upper leg, torso. Pretty simple. So the way Keynes equations work is, oops, how do I, uh, yeah. So, you know, Newton-Euler form is F equals MA, T equals I alpha. Uh, if you can imagine writing F minus MA equals zero, and then generalizing both the, for, the translational and uh, rotational components to, to a general form, you get Keynes equations, which is FR plus FR star equals zero. So it's analogous to F and MA. <coughs> so that's what we do in the next step. FR and FR star are the outputs of the Keynes equation command. You supply the forces and the bodies, and it does that for you. And then we'll want to simplify the results before we print them out, otherwise it gets a bit messy. There's all the LaTeX output, and then uh, math. <laughs> Lots of math. Well, that, that bracket printing could be, could have been prettier. Uh, anyways, this is what I would classify as a toy problem. This is something you would be given on a test, and it wouldn't be the only problem on a test. And this is the output you generate from it. So hopefully this helps motivate why this software exists. For a 2D toy problem, you get like, I don't know, this would be probably a page of writing. Uh, and the software is capable of handling actual 3D systems with multiple bodies, arbitrary things. And they generate, you know, 100 pages worth of code, you know, when you uh, generate the equation. So. It actually has a purpose, not just for, you know, stringing together a few little bodies. Okay, but these are in the second, or no, I'm sorry, not second order. These are uh, not in first order form. They're, you know, f of x comma x dot comma x double dot equals zero. If you guys are, you know, ordinary different differential equation form. And what we want to do is rewrite them into x dot equals gx comma t, right? So the time derivative of our states, our coordinates and speeds, is just a function of the current coordinates and speeds and the time. And in order to do this, a helpful way to think about the uh, output of these equations is what's called a mass matrix and a forcing vector. So if you look at the term here, you have m of x comma t times x dot 
equals f of x comma t. So is this a form that's familiar to anyone? A few of you? If you've done any vibrations analysis, right, you, you see a similar form? It, it's basically, again, a generalized form of Newton's equations. m times x dot equals f. Uh, the only difference is because these are complicated systems, these uh, force unit mass terms are dependent on the current configuration, meaning the velocities and positions. So to get it to a first order form, which you would pass to your ODE integrator, you basically need to invert the mass matrix and multiply it by the force vector. So it's you know, G equals inverse of M times F. Um, for any real problems, it's pretty hard to do this symbolically. But uh, I think it works for a lot of them. It just takes, I mean it works for this one, but it also just takes a really long time, even if it's you know, a simple problem. Okay, so what we do is we're gonna output the mass matrix of the system. Let me scroll up a little. And then simplify it so it's a little easier to read. And then uh, you can scroll to the, to the side. Damn it. I like the scrolling on my computer better. Anyways, you guys can see what the mass matrix looks like here. And then we're going to do the same thing where we output the forcing vector so you can look. So hopefully you guys don't really have too many questions about uh, how this works. We, we've tried to make it fairly easy where you basically feed it your problem definition and you don't have to worry too much about the actual math involved in forming these equations of motion, which are then in a form you pass to your ODE integrator to simulate your system with. So any questions about this one or the previous two notebooks? Back to Jason. So we're, we're two hours in. We're going to have a, what's, what is, does anyone know what the recommended break is? Is it 10 or 20? It's 10, min, 10 minutes, or you guys want 20 minutes? 10 minute break. We'll be back at 10.15. Uh, and uh, we'll be here if you want to ask any questions. And um, the next session we'll jump from symbolics to numerics, and we'll get to see this system moving. All right. Thanks.